that this next session is titled The Antichrist of Black Liberation Theology. So if you thought that they were going to do anything to pull punches or be unclear in any way, that the, just the title of that should be enough to satisfy your curiosity and show that that is not what is going to happen. So with that, Virgil, you are up next. All right, we're moving right along, and you all are hanging in there, and so I'm proud of you for that. Um, what I want to do in this session, I want to give you a little bit of background for um, the topic and, and what we're going to do uh, in our time together. I do hope that you are uh, taking notes, and uh, I'm just trying to make sure I have everything that I need up here with me, and I do. Um, I wanted to, to start out again, I want to first give you kind of a little bit of background, what uh, the title is why we uh, titled it this way and what we did with it. Daryl and I, is, as we got uh, to thinking about the um, uh, G3 event that we were doing, it was G3, I think 2021, at the National Conference. Uh, the, the conference was on Christ, and uh, the, the, um, every speaker kind of, kind of laid out a case for, for who Christ is in a different way. Daryl and I got tasked to do kind of a, a session, and while I'm always humbled by the opportunity to present, it was incredibly humbling for me uh, to get a main session. Um, one of the things that, that uh, Dr. Bice did with, the, with our time was he, I, I loved how he started out. He started out by saying that uh, what, what Daryl and I do uh, is not for the purpose of entertainment per se. Uh, it is for the purpose of education. Uh, it is for the purpose of equipping. Um, and as a result, as we looked at uh, the different issues that were in our culture uh, regarding uh, black theology, you've heard us talk a lot about that, regarding BLM, regarding um, all of the issues surrounding social justice, we thought it was important to really unmask the Christ, the Antichrist, of black liberation theology. If you've never been exposed to what black liberation theology is, um, you're going you're gonna to hear about it today. What Daryl did uh, is a fantastic job of laying out a historic framework for, he started with, with CT, with critical theory, uh, and, and how that kind of morphed uh, into, I believe it was CLS, right? right? Uh, critical legal studies, and how out of that we get CRT. Uh, he told you what that framework was, how that worked, uh, where it stemmed from, its origins, uh, its Marxist origins. Uh, in between that, that trajectory, that's more of the secular framework for the ideology. The question then becomes, how did this thing go from a secular, anti-God, anti-biblical framework to rearing its head into evangelicalism? H how did it go from something outside there to inside here? Um, what, what took place? And so there's a, there's, a, there's a thread, if you will, there's a branch, if you will, uh, of, of what came along, and I'm, we're going to talk about, you're going to hear a lot about James Cone uh, and his black liberation theology, the origins of that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pause. You, you, I'm going to read a lot of quotations to you. And again, Daryl and I make no bones about um, wanting to share original source material with you. Uh, why? Because it's not our opinion that we're, that we're delivering. It's not an idea that we had, and we think somebody said something some way, somehow, and as a result, uh, here's what we came up with. No. You're going to hear Cone and others in their own words, with their own writing. And, and, and really, I'll leave it up to you to make the assessment of, of whether it's right or wrong, whether it's good or bad. Truth be told, uh, I think Cone will be very clear. He'll be crystal clear about what he means when he says uh, what he does. So that's kind of what you're in for in this session. It is power packed, a lot of information, a lot of content. I'll do my best to slow down at points so that you can gather kind of what's being said. I'll also take some time to mention names that you'll need to write down or, or perhaps books that you'll want to have in a library if you'd like to do any deeper study. With that said, let's dive in. Daryl, again, did a fantastic job of walking you through origins. And with those who are unfamiliar with, let me, let me ask by show of hands, we haven't done this. How many of you all are familiar with the Just Thinking Podcast? Raise your hands. That's almost everybody in the room. If you've never heard of the Just Thinking Podcast, raise your hand. Now, what's wrong with you people? <laughs> what you need to do is grab your phone, 
and go to apps, not apps, go to wherever you would do your podcast, wherever you get podcasts, and download Just Thinking, the Just Thinking podcast, JT podcast. You will want that. And the reason why I mention it at this point is because we spend six hours talking about BLM. There's another, gosh, I'd say six hours of additional content on CRT alone that where we do deep dives into things. And so if you heard something here, probably it would be great for you to have and in your hip pocket as a part of a library that you can go back to and reference. And you, you, you don't have to read the content. You can just hear us kind of walk back through it. So I'm hoping that that's helpful. Let me jump into my content. As believers, there's an important distinction for us of being in the world and not of the world. As believers in Christ, we're called out of the world and into the beautiful light of Christ. As Daryl and I have watched uh, church culture over the past few years, it's absolutely been puzzling to us to see so many uh, in evangelicalism, professed believers in Christ, actually adopt the ideologies of the world. Particularly as it pertains to the, to the partial or full embrace of what's known as critical race theory. We see this in far too many of our nation's pulpits. It was the Apostle Paul and his admonition to the church at Ephesus that, where he explained that the purpose of the pastor teacher is to equip the saints for works of ministry. And he he encouraged that to be done so that they would would no longer be tossed to and fro like children by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine. That's Ephesians 4, 14. Sadly, in in our estimation, as we survey the landscape of, of culture, one of the things that we're seeing and noting is that many pastors and teachers are derelict in their duty. They're they're either embracing this ideology or they're too afraid to say anything about it. Daryl mentioned this earlier, and, and again, not in an effort to, to in, embarrass Pastor Jim, but it, it takes courage to, to, to open up your space and, and, and talk about these things uh, in, a, in a very open way. Why? Because you, you risk uh, other, other parts of culture, even church culture, other pastors thinking, oh, you, you guys are that church. Oh, you guys are those kind of people. Yeah, you know, the racist kind. And, 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 and that's, that's, that's very, there are places and spaces where, uh, you know, there's a, a, an elder who will send an email or an inbox message. I'm sure Daryl has seen this too. And we would love to have you, but we just, we're, we're, not, we're not there yet. What do you mean? You're not where the scripture is on these issues? <laughs> What do you mean you're not there yet? Like, Scripture's clear, so let's talk about it. Well, you know, it's just, uh, you know, it's... And, and, and that's what we're seeing. Um, during our time together, I want to walk through several ideas that expose how we got from critical theory to critical race theory within evangelicalism. Before I do that, I want to remind you of two important things that... that, that, that one, one is one that Daryl mentioned. The other is a resource that I think will be helpful for you. Uh, first, what Daryl shared regarding the unbiblical nature of critical race theory. He provided you at the end of his talk with five reasons that CRT is unbiblical. Five reasons why CRT is unbiblical. I'm going to walk you back through those because I think it's critical that you leave here uh, with, with ammo, right? With, with being equipped. This is the equipped conference. So I want you to be equipped with the conversations you need to have with people you love and care about over the kitchen table, because that's where these kinds of issues take place. It's not, it's not uh, uh, in, in debate sessions where people's minds are changed or conversations are happening. What happens is you, you have family over, it's, it's Sunday afternoon, everybody's there, and maybe some issue from last week comes up, and then you're talking about it. Right. And then and then a family member is kind of leaning in a direction where you're thinking, wait a minute, what are you what are you talking about? And then you want to have something to say, but you don't. I want you to have something to say from a biblical standpoint. Let me give you those five reasons again. He said that that the that critical race theory is unbiblical for at least the following five reasons. The first one was that it categorizes image bearers into groups, categorizes image bearers into groups for the purpose of causing division. It categorizes image bearers into groups for the purpose of causing division and antagonistic class struggle. If you don't know how to spell antagonistic, don't worry, neither do I. (laughs) 
the, the, it categorizes image bearers of God into groups to cause division and class struggle. You can leave it, you can leave it there. Let me give you some verses of scripture. Image, the image bearer component, of course, is, is Genesis 1.27. We talked about that earlier. Genesis 1.27, there's your image bearers. Gen- Genesis 5.12, the categorizing into groups. Titus 3.10 through 11. So Genesis 1.27, Genesis 5.2, Titus 3.10 and 11. Number two, it, in, uh, it imparts sinful motives. It imparts sinful motives to certain image bearers. That's important. It imparts sinful motives to certain image bearers solely based on the color of their skin. It imparts sinful motives to certain image bearers solely based upon the color of their skin. Why is that wrong? Well, we, we talked about it earlier today. Acts 17, 27. We're all one, Right? We're all one, we, uh, it, is, it is God who made man from one man, right? God creates one man and creates all the nations, the ethnos. All, all the different ethnicities come from one man. We're one human race made up of multiple ethnicities, right? So that's why that, that's wrong because it imparts sinful motives to certain image bearers of God solely on the basis of the color of their skin. Number three, it transfers guilt CRT transfers the guilt of presumed sins. It transfers the guilt of presumed sins. The presumed sins of past generations. It transfers guilt of the presumed sins of past generations to those of present generations. And that's Daryl coined the phrase sin by proxy. Right. That, that was the idea that, that I, I read earlier. If you remember in my talk, I talked, uh, I gave you the, the quote from uh, Thabiti Anwabile, where he had mentioned uh, that, that, that though you weren't directly responsible for, for killing Martin Luther King, you should at least admit that your grandparents were responsible in some way, that your parents or grandparents were directly responsible for the death. You were culpable in some way, shape or form, whether you knew it or not. And, and if, you, uh, if, you, if you didn't feel that sense of guilt, the the least that you should do, Amwabile said, is, is to work in the same way, uh, of, in the giving of your life, uh, in the same way that Martin Luther King did. So he, he's, he's encouraging you to participate in this works-based righteousness on the basis of, of a sin that, that he's presumed you're guilty of simply on the basis of what, you're, what he believes your ancestors were responsible for. Not, we, could, we could unpack that and, and, and demolish it for the foolishness that it is because that same truth won't apply to him and his ancestors. Uh, Daryl, I know what, what he's going to talk about in the next talk, but he's going to tell you a little bit about, about his background and his upbringing. I won't steal his thunder, but make note of, of what he'll share with you uh, about his background uh, regarding, the, regarding sins of past generations. Uh, the, the text of scripture there is Ezekiel 18.20. Ezekiel 18.20. Number four, it is rooted in the sin of ethnic partiality. CRT is rooted in the sin of ethnic partiality. And there he quoted James 2, 9, James 2, 9. And lastly, lastly, CRT promotes materialistic covetousness. You want somebody's stuff as a result, right? It promotes materialistic covetousness and envy under the guise of justice and equality. It promotes materialistic covetousness. You want other people's stuff and envy under the guise of justice and equality. Let me give you some verses of scripture there. Exodus 20, 17, Ezekiel 18, 20. So Exodus 20, 17, Ezekiel 18, 20. You have John 6, 27. And then 1 John 2, 9 through 11. I'll give you those one more time. Exodus 20, 17, Ezekiel 18, 20. John 6, 27, 1 John 2, 9 through 11. 
I slowed down for the purpose of you having this, this, this equipping. I want you to have a, a sheet of paper that you can go and begin thinking through these ideas so that when you do have the kitchen table conversation, you have something substantive rather than an emotional response. These, these kinds of conversations, if you're not really armed and equipped with a, a lot of information, it's very easy to get into an emotional, an emotionally charged battle with someone. And if you, if you feel yourself getting that way, the other, the other default will be you'll say nothing at all. I I don't want you to do either of those things. I don't want you to be emotionally wound up, and I don't want you to say nothing at all. I want you to be armed and equipped with the Word of God so that you can deal with what you are encountering. The second thing that I want to make you aware of, I want to point you to, is a document that is incredibly helpful for your study. It was in 2018 uh, that, that a number of, of great men that you would know and respect, the statement I think has end up, end up, ended up being called the John MacArthur Statement, right? It's the, it's the statement on social justice and the gospel. Um, and and I, I, want to, uh, I want to encourage you uh, to read that document. You can go to W www.statementonsocialjustice.com. Again, www.statementonsocialjustice.com. If you go there, what you're going to see is just, again, some, some great men, including John MacArthur. I know uh, I, Tom Askell was involved. I know my brother Daryl was involved in some of the, some of the writing. Uh, just some, some great men of God that, that got together and, and just really dealt with this early, early in 2018, and you can go there and sign your name to the statement if you want to, just to say, I, I, I too affirm these things. But in my estimation, I, I, I personally think that the statement should be not taken off of, off of the website, but, but, but used like as curriculum. Uh, and I, I may go back and talk to, talk to Scott Annual, our, our executive vice president and editor-in-chief at, at G3, that we need to take that document and, and, and push it into a, a curriculum that people can think about and use so that they can have a biblical anthropology. But I'm hoping that you'll find that helpful. My goal in our time together, I want to accomplish two things. One, I want you to understand the interconnection of the social gospel, liberation theology, and black liberation theology to CRT. I know that's a mouthful, and I think I got two hours to work with, so I'm going to make that work. I want, to, I want you to understand the interconnectedness of the social gospel, liberation theology, Black liberation theology to CRT. So you had a social gospel, and the reason why I'm pulling the social gospel is because what it does to critical theory, I told you this, critical theory, uh, uh, critical legal studies, all of these are godless ideologies that are out there. They're Marxian in nature. Well, it would be the social gospel that would tap into it and pull kind of a, a, a thread, a cord, if you will, into the evangelical structure. Right? And I'm using that term very, very loosely, evangelical. I'm, I'm simply, I think that's a term you'll understand into, into Christian culture, right? So you'll have a Walter Rauschenbusch who will go into the stream of critical theory and pull a, a strand in his direction uh, to have impact in the area of, of, of where he was in New York. I'll, I'll walk you through those pieces. And then what you'll have, again, uh, with black liberation theology, they'll go back out into the stream of critical theory and pull into their stream of black liberation theology. So you'll see these cords, these strands that help set the framework for what is happening in evangelicalism regarding CRT and critical race theory. I know that was alphabet soup, and I'm hoping you're following me. But if not, let's just walk through this information. My first goal, understand the interconnectedness of the social gospel, black liberation theology, and CRT. Number two, I want to contrast and compare the civil rights movement with the modern-day uh, social justice movement. I want to compa- contrast and compare the civil rights movement which had its genesis in the so-called black church with today's social justice movement. First goal, understand the interconnectedness of the social gospel, black liberation theology, and CRT. The question that must be asked and answered is how have these foreign ideas made their way into evangelical circles? For many, this is a bit of a mystery, but as Daryl explains, much of what we face today is the result of cultural Marxism. This is the same cultural Marxism instituted by men like Max Horkheimer, a German philosopher and sociologist who gave us the Frankfurt School. He applied critical theory on a larger scale, and Daryl explained how, how this influence would become evident in every facet of culture. But now, 
as, as vital as it is to trace the origins of, of CT, it's equally important to understand how the worldview entered our theological framework. You see, when you combine the godless ideologies of Marxism uh, and critical theory with the religious fervor of men like Walter Rauschenbusch and his social gospel of the early 1900s, you, 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 begin, to, you begin to see what takes place. From there, you have the liberation theology that would take place in South America in the 60s, 50s, and 60s, uh, along with the 70s uh, and, and later on with men like James Cone and black liberation theology. You have what we currently see in our current climate with critical race theory. So let me back up and give you some context for these people. Known as the father of, social, of the social gospel. He was known as the father of the social gospel. This is Walter Rauschenbusch. Let me spell the name if you haven't had a chance to write it down. R-A-U-S-C-H-E-N-B-U-S-C-H. Walter Rauschenbusch. R-A-U-S-C-H-E-N. B-U-S-C-H. He was a Baptist pastor and theologian in the early 1900s. He would bring us the social gospel. And if you remember this period in, in time in America, this was a, a period of massive immigration and influx of people that were coming upon the shores there uh, in, in New York, uh, immigrants from all walks of life. Well, he, uh, Rauschenbusch began his pastorate in the second German Baptist church in Hell's Kitchen, New York. Again, Rauschenbusch is known as the father of the social gospel, and his view of Christianity, in short, was that its purpose was not, the, not for, simply for the salvation of sinners. So his thought process about Christianity was, well, this is not for the salvation simply of sinners. Instead, Christianity is the savior for society. That was his idea. Now, if there's anything you've ever heard Daryl or me say on the podcast, Daryl, I think Daryl coined it. I probably stole it from him and didn't give him credit wherever I said it. Um, I, I'm sure I did. He said that Jesus did not come to save society. Jesus came to save sinners. Known again as the father of liberation theology, Gustavo Gutierrez, Gustavo Gutierrez, He's known as the father of liberation theology. He was a Catholic priest, and he was practicing Marxian liberation theology in South America, whereby groups were identified as oppressed, who were the poor, and the oppressors, who were the wealthy. Now, Gutierrez called for the liberation of these groups. His ideological beginnings were initially about just simply better working conditions. That's really what, what he was after. He thought, man, all these, peop these poor people are here. We should probably get them better working condition. However, these would eventually extend theologically into a space where he identified the oppressed and the oppressor. And his thought was, that his idea was that Jesus only identified with the oppressed. And he came to liberate the oppressed not from their sin, but from their oppressors. That was the idea, in short, of Gustavo Gutierrez. What Gutierrez and other liberation theologians were doing in the mid to late 1960s actually caught the attention of one James Cohn. So James Cohn is looking at the landscape of culture, seeing where it's having impact, especially in South America, seeing how Jesus is, is identified with the oppressed and how they're, they're having some, some gains, even to the degree that the Catholic Church at the time actually wanted to kick uh, Gustavo Gutierrez out of their midst. He, he was bad for business. He was upsetting the apple cart, if you will, in South America. And so when Cohn saw this, he thought, oh, there, there might be something useful there. James Cohn, he was known as, the, as a, he was a, a, a theologian, and I, use the, I would use that term in air quotes. Uh, if, if you ever get a chance, and I would encourage you, given that we've done, that we've done this, this uh, weekend with you, I would now, after that, encourage you to, to read the works of James Cohn. I'm going to quote copiously from him in, in just momentarily, and you'll, you'll understand what, what, what I mean by that. Um, but but I, I think it would be good for you to, to read James Cohn, because what you realize quickly is that he was no theologian at all. He, his, his theology was rather weak. He was, a, he was the, uh, a, a Judith Moyers Distinguished Professor Emeritus of Systematic Theology at Union Theological 
Seminary in New York. Now, if you remembered uh, anything that, that Daryl talked about uh, earlier, he, he, I think it was during the Q&A where he said uh, anything from Union Theological Seminary, they should just take the word seminary off of it. Uh, these are the people, if, you, if you're paying attention to, to what's happening in the news, these are the people who are, who are, are uh, when everyone was bending the knee to the, to the nearest black person that they could find during the Black Lives Matter uh, things going on, these people were bending their knee to trees, right? Asking for the forgiveness of, of trees. Uh, and this is what was happening in, in their quote unquote seminaries at that time. Many people consider James Cone the father of black liberation theology. And as you trace, uh, uh, critical race theory within modern evangelicalism. It's crucial to note James Cone for his influence. Why? The works of Cone are now actually being celebrated within some of the most conservative theological seminaries of our day. If, 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 I, if, if I thought about it, I, I could have pulled a, pulled a Justin Peters and, and had a video up and shown you a lot of these professors from, uh, from quote unquote conservative seminaries who are, who are, who are proclaiming the, the, the great work of James Cone. I want you to listen to James Cone today in our time together to, and, and for you to assess in your own mind whether or not his work is of tremendous value. As we always do on Just Thinking, I want to begin by defining black liberation theology in the terms of what the public would have heard it uh, on July 31st, 1966. So I'm going to treat you as the public would have been treated to black liberation theology July 31st, 1966, when the National Committee of Black Churchmen were responsible for uh, exposing, or, or yeah, for, for exposing the public rather to black theology. This was a committee of black churchmen. They would comprise approximately, eventually, approximately 300 men from various ecumenical and ecclesiastical backgrounds. Here's a statement in part. Here's how it reads quote, This is a definition, a defining of black theology. And you're hearing this definition from about 300 black churchmen who agreed to this definition. These are not my words. This is not somebody who hates what they're doing, who's trying to tell you what they meant to say. These are these men in their own words. Quote, for us, black theology is a theology of black liberation. It seeks to plumb the black condition in light of God's revelation in Jesus Christ so that the black community can see that the gospel is commensurate with the achievement of black humanity. I don't even know what that is. Black theology is a theology of blackness. It is the affirmation of black humanity that emancipates black people from white racism. So Jesus no longer comes to, uh, to, to, to pay for as a, as a propitiation for, for the, the, the sin debt that you owe a, a holy God, a thrice holy God. Jesus Christ now comes for the purpose of emancipating you from white racism thus providing authentic freedom both for white and black people, end quote. Uh, one, uh, once, a, once a critic of social justice, now an advocate for social justice, I'm going to quote to you from Dr. Anthony Bradley. Let me say that again. Once a critic, Bradley was once a critic of social justice, now an avid, rabid advocate of social justice. But at the time he wrote a book, criticizing social justice. And, and I thought when I read the book, I thought it was worth, the, the, the critique was, was, a, was a solid, sound critique. He has since changed directions and positions on many of these issues. His book was called Liberating Black Theology. Now, I had a problem with the title because it, it's a play on words, liberation, black theology. But there was a thought process that should have been picked up when I read the book that, 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 there was, that, that Bradley was holding out hope to some degree. That, that black liberation theology or black theology could somehow be used in a positive light. So while he offers a solid critique of the work, he also at the end of the book holds out, you know what, there may be some way to use this. I want to be clear, I absolutely reject that premise and idea. But if you, do, if you do happen to go get the book, I want you to be aware of what you're going to find in there. I do want to quote from it because he writes this. He talks about James Cone's hermeneutic, and he says this, quote, Cone and his writings remain critical of an orthodox evangelical theology that maintains the infallibility and inerrancy of the scriptures 
and the creature creator distinction and holds the scriptures as final authority over all matters of faith. The, uh, those positions fail to uncover issues important to the wretchedness of the earth. Let me stop there. What, what, what uh, Bradley is stating here is that Cone's theology, he rejects anything orthodox and evangelical. And he does so on the basis of the fact that he does not hold to the infallibility of the text of Scripture. He does not hold to inerrancy of Scripture. He holds to the idea that Scripture can only be used in matters where, 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 where I can be seen as the victim. If, if I can use Scripture to identify myself with, with being oppressed or being a victim, I will use Scripture. Where scripture doesn't help my personal cause, I will abandon it or negate it or not use it. And you'll see that in his own words. Cone's own words from his book, A Black Theology of Liberation, he states this, quote, To the contrary, he says, many conservatives would say that the Bible is not a blueprint on matters of faith. It is a valuable symbol for pointing to God's revelation in Jesus, but it is not self-interpreting. Do you see what he's doing? He's saying, you know, you, you, can't, you can't look at it like I can look at it. He's, he's about to insert his own ideas into the text. The only way that you could understand it in the way that, that, I, that I do is if you had black skin. And the reason you don't read the text of Scripture in the same way that I do is because you're not like me. What Conan, by extension, black liberation theology is advocating is that you throw away your Bible unless he and other black theologians can abuse the text of scripture to promote a Marxist form of social justice. If anyone thinks I'm exaggerating about the Marxian framework for black liberation theology, Cohn tells us so in his book uh, entitled For My People, Black Theology and the Black Church. On page 186, he says this, quote, the Christian faith does not possess, listen closely, the Christian faith does not possess in its nature the means for analyzing the structure of capitalism. If you think about the talk that you just heard Daryl give, what is the, what is the main issue with, with the idea around capitalism? The, the main thought is, well, capitalism is endemic or, or connected to white supremacy. So in order to get rid of white supremacy, we have to get rid of capitalism. That's the idea and in, 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 you know, pervading thought behind what is taught. Cohn says the Christian faith does not possess in its nature the means for analyzing the structure of capitalism. He says Marxism, however, as a tool for social analysis, can disclose the gap between appearance and reality and thereby help Christians to see how things really are. So the lens that you need to use, the economic lens that you need to use to really understand things is a Marxian Lands. And again, that's from his book, uh, For My People, Black Theology and the Black Church, page 186. So Marxism is the tool that is suggested by Cohn, and, and his form of orthodoxy is, is actually heterodoxy. In case there's any misunderstanding about what Cohn is believing and saying, I used to, uh, uh, when I initially gave this talk, I would sit audiences down and play a game of who said it first. And in the game, what I would do is I would take uh, quotes from James Cone and I would lay them side by side with, with uh, quotes from the, the Ku Klux Klan. I would use their theology, their ideas and theology and put them side by side. I would take out the words white and or black from each of the, of the quotes that were given. And I would ask the audience, who said it first? Was it Cone or the KKK? Now, we don't have time to play that game here, though it would be entertaining to see how you responded. It's incredible how aligned their viewpoints, their worldviews actually are. In an article titled Christianity and Black Power, Cohn writes this, quote, Jesus' death on the cross represented God's boundless solidarity with victims, even unto death. Jesus' resurrection is good news that there is new life for the poor, that is not determined by their poverty, but overcomes it. Right? What is he appealing to here? He's appealing to a social justice Jesus who looks out for the poor and identifies who they are and, and helps them out of that temporal poverty. The, the poverty is never the weightiness of their sin. 
It's simply their temporal or perceived oppression by other men who don't look like them. James Cone would, would write this in his book, Black Theology and Black Power. He says this, quote, for white people, God's reconciliation in Jesus Christ means that God has made black people a beautiful people. And if they, white people, are going to be in relationship with God, listen closely, they must enter utilizing their black brothers who are a manifestation of God's presence on the earth. This is ethnic deism. Do you see it? This is ethnic deism. Your road to salvation is now not through Jesus Christ and him crucified, but through the nearest black brother that you can find because that black brother or sister is a manifestation of God's presence on the earth. Again, if you think about what is being said here and you mirror it against what is said by organizations like the Klan, these kinds of things align themselves completely. Black Theology and Black Power, again, initially published in 1969, uh, James Cone writes this, quote, If the gospel is a gospel of liberation for the oppressed, then Jesus is where the oppressed are and continues his work of liberation there. Jesus is not safely confined in the first century. He's our contemporary, proclaiming release to the captives and rebelling against all who silently accept the structures of injustice. If he, Jesus, is not in the ghetto, listen closely, if he is not where the men are living at the brink of existence, but is rather in the easy life of the suburbs, then the gospel is a lie. Is this not why God became a man in Jesus Christ so that man might become as he is? This is, this is, a, this is an ethnic little God's doctrine, right? Right? This is the idea that, 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 that if, if I'm the right ethnicity, I can, I can, I can be a God. I, I, can, I can have the same. Isn't that why Christ came to make me deity? He says this. He goes on in that same quote. He says, as long as man is a slave to another power, he is not free to serve God with mature responsibility. And he's not free to become what he is, which is human. I, I wish I could take this quote uh, and frame it for you. Because in the next talk that, that uh, my brother, is, is, is Daryl, is going to deli deliver, you're going to hear about a, a slave who absolutely would repudiate this statement in and of itself. I won't steal my brother's thunder by any stretch, but I just want you to remember what Cone said. He, he says that if he's a slave to another power, he is not free to serve God with mature responsibility. He's not free to become what he, is, what he really is, human. I want you to remember that again in light of what you'll hear when Daryl returns. Uh, what Cohn is arguing is the same thing that men before him argued. Men like Gutierrez and, and Rauschenbusch, uh, they desired a Jesus who came to save society instead of one that came to save sinners. They were looking for quick fix Jesus to deliver them from temporal outcomes. And the reality is that is not the goal of Christ. What Cohn and Gutierrez and Rauschenbusch believe is that Christ came to do exactly the opposite of, of what he prayed for and talked about. Jesus came to, if Jesus came to save societies, then the, then the Jews and even the disciples would have been right in believing that the overthrow of the Roman government uh, was, was the right thing to do in establishing the kingdom. However, Jesus would instruct that his kingdom would not be a kingdom that he would establish through, through change from the outside, but rather that the kingdom would be a part of the heart transformation necessitating the complete change from the inside out. What we're witnessing are, are men who desire to see this transformation, this utopia, if you will, take place from the outside in. They're trying to use their, their own powers of persuasion, their own ideological framework, their own economic empowerment, their own political strategy in an effort to, to change society into what they believe it needs to be. Well, the gospel of the kingdom works absolutely the reverse way. What happened in the first century after, after Jesus ascends, right? Those men whose hearts were transformed began to have a massive impact on the culture, but they did so not by trying to change the government structure. They did so because of the heart transformation that was in on the inside of them. And they began to proclaim that gospel message person to person, house to house. And the society and the culture transformed as a result. 
So that by the time we, we, we read about Paul and, and, and at the church in, in Ephesus and, and Acts 17 and 18, and you unpack what Paul is doing, there's a riot that breaks out. Why? Because, because the, the silversmith there is, is upset because everybody in the world seems to be turning over their, their hearts and giving them to Christ. And it's having a large economic impact on Ephesus. He's saying, we're going we're gonna to get out of, if, if all of these f- folks become believers, we're going to be out of business soon. Nobody's going to want to worship the goddess Artemis. What's going to happen to us? Well, he didn't do that based upon them marching on, on, on Rome. No one did that as a result of them deciding they were going to change the political structure during that time. They did so person to person, heart to heart, as a result of gospel proclamation. I, I want to move on to goal number two in our time together uh, as it pertains to the interconnectedness of the ideas of CRT. Again, I talked about men like Rauschenbusch, Gutierrez, and Cohn. And what they did, what these men did, I, I told you about these strands, these strings that they bring into uh, uh, evangelicalism, if you will, Christianity, if you will. Their work laid the foundation for a theological framework for the Marxian ideology to rest on. Do you see that? They begin to put terminologies and ideas and misuse and abuse the text of Scripture for the purpose of laying a groundwork, a foundation for others to build upon later on down the road. These godless ideologies, critical theory, critical race theory, now would have a theological framework for which modern crits would lay the foundation of what we see in evangelicalism today. So I I wanted to make the case that the way that this invaded our day, just like I did in the previous talk when I talked about gender theory, I took you to 1949, right, Uh, with with Simone de Beauvoir, and I showed you how her ideas 70 years ago infected everything to the degree that by 1990, uh, we have Judith Butler espousing ideas that now everyone in culture is talking about today. I wanted to also take you through the process of from what Daryl did with, with CT, CLS, and CRT and show you how these, these pseudo-theological uh, ideas of, of men like Gutierrez uh, and, 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 uh, and, and Rauschenbusch and others began, and Cohn began to pull from that idea into Christian uh, circles for the purpose of laying the groundwork for what we are experiencing. My second goal is I want to contrast and compare the civil rights movement, which had its primary genesis in the so-called black church, with today's social justice movement. I'll be quick as I run through this. In his famous speech given on August 18th, 1963, and delivered under the shadow of one of the most symbolic American monuments, the Lincoln Memorial, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. delivered his famous I have a dream speech. And in his speech, Dr. King would explain the grievances of Negro life in great detail as he and many others had experienced it during the days of Jim Crow and segregation. It would be this platform that Dr. King would would use to call America to the height and beauty of the Judeo-Christian ideals that permeate the nation's founding documents. King would say this, quote, in a sense... We've come to our nation's capital to cash a check. When the architects of our republic wrote the magnificent words of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, they were signing a promissory note to which every American was to fall heir. This note was a promise to all men. Yes, black men as well as white men would be guaranteed the unalienable right of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Dr. King would go on to say this, quote, we refuse to believe that the bank of justice is bankrupt. We refuse to believe that there are insufficient funds in the great vaults of opportunity of this nation. And so we've come to cash this check, a check that will give us upon demand the riches of freedom and the security of justice, end quote. Dr. King would then appeal to the equality of all humanity in the most famous portion of his speech when he said this, quote, I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where we will not be judged by the color of their skin, but they will be judged by the content of their character, end quote. 
While, again, many theologians struggle with Dr. King's theology, and you should. There's a lot to struggle with. There's a lot of issues with Dr. King. I'd argue that he wasn't a believer in Christ. I I would argue that, that he was not a Christian. I would be very clear about that. But in the common grace of God, there were things that he got right for which we can point to and say, that right there, that's right. And it's based upon a biblical worldview that did not originate with Dr. King, but that originated from Scripture. Amen? Let me keep going. Dr. King appealed to three central components that, are, that were identified at the core of his movement. And they were these. One, an appeal to the, to the Judeo-Christian founding of the United States. He appealed to the Judeo-Christian founding of the United States and, ident- and identified it in his founding documents. He, he, he referenced the Constitution of the United States and the Declaration of Independence. At the time of his speech, Dr. King delivered this, number two, an appeal for the equality of opportunity rather than the equity of outcomes. I want to say that again. His appeal was to the equality of opportunity rather than to the equity of outcomes. And this could be seen in the language of freedom, liberty, and justice for all, black men and white men. Number three, he appealed to the Imago Dei in all of humanity. He appealed to the Imago Dei in all of humanity. This could be heard in the constant language of equality for people of every ethnicity and background, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants, Catholics. He appealed to the Imago Dei in all of humanity. On these three accounts, based upon the common grace of God, he got these things right. But even if we were to, to assess King in, 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 in what he stood for, based upon today's standards, the monument that should be torn down is King's monument in Washington, D.C. Why? Because his appeal was not on the basis of color of skin, but on the basis of content of character. And today's modern social justician would have problem with the idea that they should not be judged on the basis of the color of their skin because that's the manner in which all judgments are actually made. Long after Dr. King's assassination on April 4th, 1968, historians would agree that this speech delivered to more than 250,000 people in the shadows of the Lincoln Memorial was the actual high point of the civil rights movement. King's constant reminder was the the cause of nonviolent protest. The hallmark, this hallmark rather, served as the strength of his movement. Again, remember, nonviolent protest was considered the strength of the movement. King said it this way, quote, we must never forget to conduct our struggle on the high plane of dignity and discipline. We must not allow our creative protest to degenerate into physical violence. Continuing to quote from King, quote, the nonviolent resistor not only avoids external physical violence, but he avoids internal violence of the spirit. He not only refuses to shoot his opponent, but he refuses to hate him. And he always stands with understanding and goodwill, end quote. Now, here we are 54 years after King's historic speech. As we examine the current landscape of culture, what we have now is the modern day social justice movement with three women, womanists, right? Now you know the difference between a feminist and a womanist, right? A feminist, that's a a what? That's a white woman (laughs) who's a feminist, who espouses the, the, the ideas of, 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 you know, of, of liberalism with regard to femininity. You don't call a black woman a feminist. Though she may, though she may subscribe to feminist ideas, what do you call her? She's a womanist. So we have three womanists, Alicia Garza, Patrice Colors, and Opal Tometi. They lead the charge for Black Lives Matter. Now, this is a new approach. To, this new approach, rather, to social justice began with the jury verdict in the case of the Trayvon Martin uh, debacle, right? On July 13th, 2013, after hearing all the evidence in the Trayvon Martin case, a six-women jury, which included one minority, found George Zimmerman not guilty. And, and again, this, the, the Trayvon Martin case, I have to pause here and say, this seems like ancient history, 2013 seems like forever ago in light of what we've encountered in the years after, right? 
But I want to revisit it. Why? Because this is the case that is placed on the, the Black Lives Matter website as the reason and rationale for why they started their, their organization to begin with. So I want to revisit it with you momentarily. This, is a, it's, this verdict was delivered despite being given at the last minute the option of three choices. So, the, so after the case, this was going to be a, a guilty or not guilty. He was either guilty of murder or not guilty. And here's what happened. After listening to all of the, 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 the content... The judge at the last hour said, wait, 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 wait. I want you to consider a couple of other additional things here. He says, I want you to consider three choices. You can either find Zimmerman guilty of second degree murder or find him guilty of the lesser charge of manslaughter or find him not guilty. Now, this began the modern day Black Lives Matter movement, as you know, that the verdict was not guilty. Next in line to follow this decision for for Black Lives Matter, they began their movement. What really stirred it was the Michael Brown case. The Michael Brown case. Now, before the investigation of the Brown case, you saw everywhere in culture the hands up, don't shoot narrative that swept the country. You had football players and, 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 and baseball players, sports, sports people all over walking out with hands up, don't shoot. This was the narrative that, I mean, you, you had news broadcasters. You had no business doing this, this, this kind of thing, doing hands up, don't shoot everywhere. From entertainers to athletes, all promoting the narrative. The Brown case, however, would be investigated by the Obama administration's Department of Justice head, Eric Holder. And in the case of Michael Brown, Obama's DOJ could not find enough evidence for the charge of the, to charge the officers with wrongdoing in the Brown shooting. I want to be clear. So if you, if you checked out, I want you to be clear. I want, I, want to, I, want to, I want to be clear. I want you to hear this. A black president, a black attorney general... A black district attorney could not find the hands up, don't shoot narrative to be accurate, nor was there enough evidence for the prosecution of the officer involved in the death of of Michael Brown. Black president, black attorney, black district attorney could not find the evidence. After a seven month investigation, Attorney General Eric Holder said the following in a statement, quote, this morning, the Justice Department announced the conclusion of our investigation and released a 87 page report documenting our findings and conclusions that the facts do not support the filing of criminal charges against Officer Darren Wilson in the case. Michael Brown's death or a tragedy did not involve prosecutable conduct on the part of Officer Wilson. The Michael Brown case notwithstanding, this was the, the, the next case that I'm going to talk about it was definitely the high point. We had for, for uh, Martin Luther King, the high point was the I have a dream speech. For the social justice movement, the high point is the George Floyd case. Now, before even the adjudication of Derek Chauvin for killing George Floyd, protests to seek justice for Floyd had spread to over 2,000 cities and towns in all 50 states, including more than 60 countries. While some protests were, quote unquote, peaceful, according to the media, it's staggering to consider the number of innocent victims killed and the inestimable cost of repair to damaged cities, cities and businesses forever lost in black communities alone, not to mention elsewhere. All of this was perpetrated by black lives mattering. These, these businesses didn't matter to black lives. The black lives that were lost didn't matter to black lives matter. If we're clear, uh, George Floyd didn't matter to Black Lives Matter. He was used for the purpose of acquiring wealth. And now we're seeing that. Daryl and I were doing podcasts talking about this. We did a podcast where I went went and, and, and examined line by line. I gave you in this podcast every single dollar amount that was presented by every single company around the country to Black Lives Matter and told you it was a fraud long before any of this information that you're hearing about today had, had, had come out. Their motives were wrong. There are numerous com- contrasts that can be made to examine this modern social justice movement with the civil rights movement. I'll, I'll, I'll do this in shorthand and, and, and walk you through what they are. Earlier I said that the civil rights movement of the 60s appealed to three things. The three things were the Judeo-Christian founding of the United States, two, the equality, of, uh, the equality rather than equity of outcome, and the Imago Dei in all of us. Now, the Black Lives Matter movement, here were their three things. You ready? They appealed to these three things, that American culture 
at its founding is racist. American culture at its founding is racist and based upon the sin of slavery. American culture at its founding is racist and based upon the sin of, is the sin of slavery. Number two, all inequity, all inequity is the result of systemic racism. So if there's an inequity anywhere, if, if I have less money in my pocket than you have, it's because you're racist. If, if I didn't get the job, not because my qualifications weren't such, but if I got it, if I didn't get it and you got it, it's because racism, right? If, if, if I score lower on a test uh, at, a, at a particular school uh, than, than whites are scoring, it's because of Racism it has nothing to do with the fact that I didn't study, didn't care, watched TV all night and stayed up and didn't study for the test. It has nothing to do with that. It has everything to do with racism. Everything, every inequity is attributed to racism. Number three, that black lives matter and no one else does. Black lives matter and no one else does. Now, for those who might be thinking I'm overstating the case, allow me to quote again from Black Lives Matter website where they state, quote, Black Lives Matter was founded in 2013 in response to the acquittal of, of, Trayvon, of the Trayvon Martin murderer. Black Lives Matter Foundation, Inc., whose mission is to eradicate white supremacy and build local power to intervene in violence inflicted on black communities by state at vigilant, and by state vigilantes. By combating and counter, uh, countering acts of violence, we want to create space for black imagination and innovation centering on black joy. I have no idea what black imagination, black joy. I, I, just, I, I don't even, I, I've never, I've been black my whole life. <laughs> Believe me. I have no idea, you know, and again, if this is, if this is being video, this will be the, the part that they capture. Yeah, he's been black his whole life, but he don't know what black joy is. I have no idea. I know what joy is. I know what imagination is, but I don't, I don't look at those things through a lens of melanin or skin color, but obviously that's what they're doing. They are winning. They said they were winning. Again, quoting from Black Lives Matter. We are winning immediate improvements in our lives. Well, yeah, that's true. They are. Daryl said it earlier. A BLM stands for, for by large mansions. Yeah, their, their lives are benefiting every, every day. They had no calls for unity, no calls for upholding, his, uh, upholding a historic Judeo-Christian values, no calls for freedom or the joy that comes from living in a just society. These contrasting approaches of these two organizations could not be more evident. So here's, here's my warning as I close. As Christians, we cannot afford to attach ourselves to an organization like this. I would argue that it would be foolish of you to parrot the same phrases. Daryl and I never bought into the idea that Black Lives Matter. You won't be able to find a place where we, where we made a statement. Yep, Black Lives Matter. Why? Because we, we want to get as far from this as possible. We want to uphold what Scripture has to say about life and about the, the lives of human beings created in the image of God mattering. In my first talk, I spent the time talking about a theology of mankind and the fact that we are all image bearers of God, of, of one race, deserving of distinct value, dignity, and worth. I shared with you in my first talk that you and I are connected. If we're in Christ, you and I are connected for eternity. Though, though I've come all the way here from Atlanta, you are here in, in Sandpoint, it's irrelevant to the fact that we are a family forever if you're in Christ. And my melanin or your lack thereof is nothing but, but, but a part of the beautiful fabric of God that created diversity. And, and, and I share this as well, Diverse, diversity in and of itself is not virtuous. Its, its beauty is inherent in the one who created it, amen? 
It is God who created diversity. And as a result of, of who God is and, and his beauty, we get to experience that in the expression of different levels of melanin in our skin. And all of it is not to fall on, on, on you. Oh, look at you. you you're, you're black. Or look at you. You're this color. You got this. All of it is for the purpose of saying, look at the beauty of God's creation. That's what it's for. It's not for the purpose of separation and division. It's for the purpose of unity, especially for us as believers, into the body of Christ. I should look out for you because you're my brother. Let somebody mess with you. I got you. You've got me. And that's how this is supposed to work. Let me conclude as, as by saying, this is my second or last conclusion. My second. <laughs> Having again presented the contrast between the civil rights movement and the modern social justice movement, I want to just encourage you with the words of Paul to the church at Ephesus. I mentioned the church at Ephesus earlier, but I want to, I want to read to you what he said to the elders uh, as he's about to depart from them in Acts 20, verses 31 and 32. He challenges them to therefore be alert, remembering that for the last three years he did not cease day or night to admonish them with tears. And now he says, I commend you to God, to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all of those who are being sanctified. Now, this was a conversation of Paul to elders of a church, to be sure. I think we could find encouragement in the fact that the, that the word of his grace is able to build us up and give us an inheritance for all of us who are being sanctified by that word, growing in grace with one another as a result of our knowledge of God's word. It's with that I'm going to close with prayer. Father God, I just thank you so much for the truth of your word, the impact uh, of it on our lives. May it sink deeply into us. May we be transformed and renewed by that word. And as a result, live lives that look differently than those of the world. May the light of the gospel shine forth in such a way that we have more opportunity to express that truth to others. The truth that you came, you lived a perfect life, you died for our sin, and if we would but repent and place our faith in you, we would experience eternal life. That is good news, and we're grateful for it. In Christ's name, amen. Thank you.